Okay, welcome back to the podcast. And just given the fact that we are very much into application season, I thought what would be a really great episode to do was to grab one of our um, community members who's gone through this process uh, all the way from um, still in study, going through spring weeks to then doing a summer internship and getting a return offer. And just conscious of the fact that lots of people will be in different parts of this application process. So what we're going to attempt to do is talk about kind of handling of applications, kind of quality versus quantity. We'll talk about online tests, talk about hire view, talk about technical behavioral interviews, uh, and then also assessment centers. But um, Gori, perhaps you could introduce yourself first though, to, to kick things off. Yes, of course. So um, thank you. I'm Gori. I'm currently studying at LSE doing PPE. I'm in my final year. It is a four year degree. And yeah, I just, as you mentioned, went through the whole spring week through and I'd say have a, had a definitely my own application experience. And now I'm going, I've found my summer conversion to join JP Morgan's investment banking team in the UK M&A team. And very excited to do that and share anything I may have picked up along the way. Yeah, so so you've had a few different experiences. Uh, I know you did spring at RBC and, and Jeffries as well. So uh, I guess the first question is this this big one that students often present to me, which is how many applications should they send? And it's this idea of every application takes a lot of time in order to do it well. So do you invest time in doing just a handful really well, or do you just go for volume? Or is there this kind of hybrid of the two? And how how did you manage that? So I think, firstly, like my condolences to anyone doing the application season, because it's really rough. Um, it's a lot of work and pressure. And I think it does pay off in the end because you just need that one company that says yes, and then you're kind of sorted good to go. But when it comes to the quality versus quantity debate, I think personally, I would say it depends on the amount of experience you have going into the application season. So when I was applying for my spring weeks, I had absolutely no experience in finance. I didn't have a lot of experience interviewing for jobs either. So I felt more secure going high quantity, not necessarily because I was interested in so many different companies and you know, even really wanted to work at some of them, but being able to use them as a practice and then bouncing off some interviews, which I knew were like lower hanging fruit than the companies that I really, really wanted, I found really useful. So I think I'd assess going into whatever stage of the application process you are, if you're doing springs or summers or grad roles, assess how much um, experience you already have and then based on that, you can be more selective. As a general rule, less experience equals less selective, in my opinion. Um, and then going from that, you can organize it into a spreadsheet to keep track of the applications that you are doing so that they don't feel too overwhelming. And honestly, I think because you're doing so many applications and a lot of them will be for the same sorts of jobs, whether that's consulting, finance or global markets, I think there's a lot of overlap between applications. So if you are going for a high quantity route, then what you can do to minimize um, like how many, how much effort you're putting into them is find as many ways as you can to get overlap between these applications. So if that's coming up with stories for behavioral interviews, um, like your leadership experiences, just keep the same ones and just repeat them and reuse them over again. And I don't think there's any penalty to doing that. I never experienced it. I don't know anyone else who has, but if you can, I actually think it's helpful. The more applications, you just get more practice and it's the same, it's the same work essentially, just multiplied. The only time when it does get a lot more effort would I, I would suggest is final round interviews when you need to have a bit more differentiation on the company you're interviewing with. But otherwise it's um it's kind of going to be a couple of months slog and the same application can be applied to different companies. Yeah. And and so the let's say all being well with success at that first hurdle. One of the first things then that you get invited to is a is a higher view. And I know a lot of people can be quite intimidated by that because yeah. they're like, I don't know how to talk to a camera or a computer. And what how long do I have to answer the questions? And what if I don't fit it all in in time? So what tips would you have on on higher view interviews? No, that makes a lot of sense. I remember thinking this is 
a crazy way to interview candidates like stick me in front of a camera um and get me speaking but it's actually I think it's really useful so firstly I think when it comes to information about the higher view itself the time it will take or the questions they might ask I think what is useful is to google maybe in the, in the email that they sent you for the higher view they'll include some information read that carefully because it might tell you how long your um interview is for or how long each answer is whether that's 30 seconds or two minutes, that's usually the range. So you know how long to aim for. Um, and then you can also see how many questions they may ask you. If they don't give you this information, then you can always Google it and ask like um, Deutsche Bank's previous higher view questions or higher view format. And usually people have spoken about it. Um, I think Glassdoor, Wall Street Oasis are all useful websites for this or asking people that you may know who have done the higher view before. But then when it actually comes to the content of the higher view, I think what's really useful, and I did this, is well, the content itself mostly revolves around your experiences, your CV and your competencies. I think that's essentially what a higher view is assessing and like how you're able to communicate them. So definitely print off your CV, I'd say annotate it and ask yourself questions on it and see, okay, there's this experience here, you were leading a society at your university. What would you ask on it? Like, you know, if you were to give an example of your leadership experience, could you summarize this and what you learned in a minute? And then I would record yourself doing all these practices, get your phone out. It feels really weird at the time, but it's very, very useful to actually watch yourself over and see maybe where you stumbled or what you did wrong. And then you also have that added pressure of having a camera on you. So you're already kind of stimulating the higher view environment so I would really recommend doing that and then for the other types of questions behavioral and competency I would google um online like common behavioral com and competency questions or common to the bank that you're interviewing at and then again re like practice them give yourself um a couple of examples for each competency I wouldn't say go beyond two examples for each say if you had a leadership question only have two examples on the back of your hand so you don't get confused between them and then just practice them again and again and through recording yourself I think that's really useful and you it's all essentially about getting comfortable with the environment because I think a lot of people struggle with getting comfortable one more tip I feel is stressed by a few companies is do look at the camera when you're speaking because they have some technology that assesses the way you speak and communicate and they do that through the camera lens in your device that you're using so that's really helpful as well um one more thing maybe to watch out usually the questions are competency based but i'd watch out for they can also ask about risks and trends in the sector or the role that you're applying for that's kind of the breadth of questions i've experienced on a higher view i don't believe they get more technical than that usually and yeah as long as you keep preparing for that i think um you should be okay for those once you get so, used to it it's okay. yeah so get, getting used to it then so if, just for a bit of context if no one's ever done a high of you how, how much practice or training do you think is required to get comfortable enough to satisfy what they're looking for so um i'd say you don't because you're speaking about yourself it sounds like a lot of work but you actually really know these stories already if you're describing your experiences. So I wouldn't say it takes more than a day to practice um, a few key competencies, read it out loud, record yourself, go over it. And I think at that point, you have those stories in your head. You might have them written down as well. And I think that's already very good. And then as you go through application season, and you do more and more higher views, you'll just get better and better and better. And you'll get tired of your stories too, because you'll have said them so many times to yourself. So I think I'd say spend a couple of days on it max before you start applying and then just get them out and get practicing. And that's essentially, it, it's, it's not, once you do it a few times over, it won't be too difficult. So it's it doesn't take more than a couple of days, I would say, to get the hang of it. Mm. And ju just um, for my benefit, in terms of the high view interviews themselves, are they a uniform length, generally speaking, or do they all differ slightly bank to bank? So they, yeah, they all differ slightly. So I think the shortest I've had is 30 seconds, which I think are very hard because you really want to show that you can manage your time and get your full story in before it cuts. So again, that's why I'd try and find out the details to the high view before you 
sit it because you know you don't want to be in a situation where you run out of time I think that's like not a great scenario to be in but then the longest interview um high view interview I've had it was three minutes for one answer which is also difficult because three minutes goes fast and then you need to be able to hit each point by the deadline so you'd have to check and kind of be able to identify the the key point in every story or answer that you say so if you do need to cut it or extend it you can um so again it's, it's about getting comfortable with it but I think when you do these questions for more and more companies you know most people have at least 40 applications if you do it 40 times over and mm. before with practice it's usually like you become pretty good at gauging how long you'll need so that's usually yeah. like yeah. So, so before we move into the like the details of, of interviews, one thing I wanted to ask is like you just mentioned the number 40. So let's say you were doing 40 applications and they all started to progress. Um, I've heard people talk about before that you obviously a lot of these banks recruit on a rolling basis. So you want to rep- apply as soon as you possibly can so that you get within that catchment. However, could you catch yourself in a situation where you do you you literally spend every hour you can you get all the applications out but they all progress and then you're in a situation where you have to sit a whole bunch of higher views or numerical tests all at the exact same time and has that happened to you or anyone you know and how would you manage that yeah that that does happen um usually there's there's a stage of the application cycle everyone is um like the very start early september is sending out applications getting your cv ready your cover letters and then in a couple of weeks time early october it will be higher views or numerical tests online psychometric tests and then a few weeks later usually early november and december is when interviews happen so it's very cyclical in that sense it has a real um like pattern to the application season i think what's helpful is to so I would say usually some of them, it's it's naturally a bit staggered because a lot of different companies have different opening dates and that does vary by a few weeks between each opening date. However, at the same time, a lot of them also do open at the same, same time. But because you're applying on a rolling basis, it is like the case that being early is the most important because, you know, if they have a space open, they're going to fill it as soon as they find the candidate for it. So if you can get in and just send your application out and be prepared for all of them to come at once, it, it is the best situation to be in. But at the same time, if you do get a bunch of higher views um, that are coming through, they usually give you a couple of days um, to complete them within. So you can do multiple within a day or within a week. And also having that practice of doing other companies' higher views, I f- think is the most important practice actually doing a proper high view to then doing another high view and it's really good preparation to have and once that stage is over then you're going to move on to the interview stage as well mm. managing it I think with university is the hardest bit because um obviously you have your studies and a lot of like you know a degree is hard so I think what I would say is maybe do a two-hour rule so I would try and stick by this is at least like every day try and get a two hour slot of just university work catching up on a lecture or problem sets anything and just getting that done and as long as you can dedicate a couple hours a day hopefully um just to university you can spend the rest of your day doing whatever applications or anything else then I think that's a good way to keep on top of it yeah and just just a final kind of anchor to the 40 number (laughs) uh, that that you mentioned So, so let's say you did 40 were they all, I mean, you're going back now to JP Morgan to work in investment banking. Were these all, would these all have been investment banking or would these been a blend of you were doing maybe investment banking or consulting or equity research or markets? Yeah, um, I think at the time, for some reason, I was very, very sold on investment banking. So most of my applications were for that. If they weren't for investment banking, then they were for global markets which either way I still feel had a lot of crossover at the time applying for spring weeks. But if you're doing, um, it's actually a good point because investment banking and and global markets, these are the roles that are usually rolling. So deadlines are a lot more important and opening dates are a lot more important to stick by. Whereas if you are throwing in some consultancy applications too, which is something I was interested, but I didn't actually 
prioritize when I was applying is those applications are not rolling. So the deadlines are usually later in October, even later than that, November, December. And there's not the pressure to get those in immediately. So I would prioritize your banking finance applications over consulting or any that are not rolling. Mm. Okay. Usually people have a mix and I think it's good too, but it also depends what stage you're in. If you're applying for grad roles, um, then maybe you might want a better idea of what you want to do. The time I was applying, I didn't, I just wanted experience, but it depends like how fine tuned you want it to be by the time you're applying. Mm. Uh, and the online testing, we did briefly mention that, but maybe we could just have a quick chat about that part of things. So numerical tests and things like that. So what, what's your experience of that and what advice would you have on that area? Yeah, so again, uh, it's about, I think it's about practice and it helps doing so many applications. But there are three main um, websites I used that I found were really helpful and replicated exactly the type of test that I'd be doing for an application. And that's job test prep, then assessment day and graduates first. I actually had a free subscription for graduates first through LSE and I found that one one of the most useful for how representative it was of the test I was doing and basically I would just walk through these um, practice tests and get a good idea of where I was going wrong or how which questions I was doing better on and just walk through all their practice questions. Ideally that would be done I say quite early on in the application phase of around when you're completing your CV but it can be done at any time because I think none of the tests are too difficult they just test skills that we haven't used in a long time like mental maths um, which I don't think anyone really does anymore at university on a regular basis so something else I did which is useful and I know a lot of consulting um, applicant, applicants do this is I downloaded an app called um, Mir Mir Maths Lite it's spelt M-I-M-I-R um, and it's this just like free app on your phone that you can do math questions on like 10 minutes a day. And it's just addition, subtraction, division, multiplication. It's really useful. And it just gets your brain back in gear, working at the pace. It could always work out. It's just, you haven't used those muscles in a while. So I think getting back used to that is, is very useful. But also when it comes to testing, I'm surprised. There's another side of it that I'm surprised that people don't always prioritize enough. And that's just having a really good environment to do your test in. So being in a quiet place, no disturbances, um, good like lighting or anything, anything that you need to feel comfortable in, in that space, because you, you are under time pressure. You may be asked difficult questions and it won't help if, you, if you're getting disturbed. So I think just ensuring you have that and good Wi-Fi connection is the most important as well to help mm. you succeed. I guess just a, maybe a, a personal insight here, because you mentioned about having two hours dedicating some time to lectures and catching up on notes and things like that. So are you quite a stickler for like allocating time through a day, question one? And I guess the offshoot of that being, how do you reward yourself in terms of um not like let's say that these are study and professional pursuit activities like do you have like a pendulum that you need to balance to have this harmony to perform do you think yeah <laughs> I think um it's funny so I'm I'm saying with hindsight what I would do but did I stick to that every day definitely not because it's very hard and when you're enforcing application season it's hard not to prioritize your applications over university. I think ideally try and keep a general structure in mind and a few hour blocks is what I find a useful way to allocate my time just to visualize what I'll be doing at different times of the day and creating some sort of routine that I've always found really, really helpful. And I think a lot of people also operate like that. Um, otherwise it's difficult to manage all the different things you have to do in a day, but allow for a lot of flexibility because there are going to be like inevitably times when you're going to get sent an email at 10 o'clock saying 10 p.m saying you have a high view that you need to complete within a day or two and obviously that's going to throw things everything that you had planned for the next day a little bit off out the window so be able to like account for that and 100% when it comes to balancing it with rewards is very very essential I think 
my my favorite way to kind of reward myself is to do some form of exercise it sounds really cringy but I, I just think when you're at a desk all day and you're like doing the same work repetitively it's really easy to get down so I'd always like try go for a walk or go um play some sport and then also you can meet your friends through doing that and you know having some time off because the application season is longer than you think in your head because it starts in like August September then it can last all the way till next year May when you might actually be getting March sorry when you're getting offers so definitely have um some way to sustain yourself and scheduling things in but I think as a university student, you get that anyway, because even without applications, you'll be really busy and then you'll have to slot different things into your schedule last minute. So it's already good practice to have a structure in mind, but allow for it to be flexible. Mm. Okay. Well, look, you're moving smoothly through the application phase now, and you've made it to interviews and these typically divided into technical and behavioral. So maybe a little bit about your experiences of those two and also preparation so you're not like a straight econ student so to speak so what was your did you feel a little bit intimidated or you know, looking at your peer group did you feel like disadvantaged at all and how did you fill that gap and then when it comes to the more the execution side of doing an interview and being under pressure and yeah. having a face-to-face -face and these sorts of things so yeah what was your yeah. take on that that section no for sure good question I think not only was I not a straight econ student I had no experience in finance really so it definitely and I think most people won't unless you've done a summer or a spring internship which is really great to have but otherwise it's difficult to get that experience so I think technical question technical interviews are the most kind of worrying when you went most stressful when you go into them so I'll start with maybe talking about behavioral and how mm -hmm. to approach those and the good thing is um there's a lot of crossover with high view questions with behavioral interviews so high views will usually ask you about um your competencies and what you do in a situation if x happened or when have you displayed compassion to a fellow worker these are the sort of questions you get in high views and they're also the questions you'd get in behavioral so in that sense exact same prep um ask yourself these questions record yourself speaking them and just have a few have two examples for each competence uh, competency on the back of your hand and you know that's just about practice and then set moving on to the actually there's another um strand of like questions as well i think motivational mm -hmm. is also a really common question to ask especially in earlier stages of the interviews so motivational for this I would say the most important thing is to build a story and build your own um, narrative as to why you really want this role so for me it doesn't necessarily have to be true it just has to flow I used an example of why I wanted to do healthcare investment banking because my parents are doctors and I never lived up to the expectation of becoming a doctor and it was just kind of like funny at the time but I could also make it believable and that's the most important thing if you can try and sell like say you're doing engineering and you want to work in industrials yeah. and investment banking yeah. sell why where the connection is there and that makes it a lot more believable and then when it comes to the questions about why this firm because that's also a really important motivational question you can if you can go on their website and find out a few facts about them that tie tie into your story then it just makes everything more complete and makes you look like a more put together candidate who's thought more about why specifically this company because again it links to the question you're asking at the beginning quantity over quality everyone most people will be going quantity I think but when it comes to the later stages it becomes more about quality and that's when a little bit more work before each interview is required to create that story with that particular company um, but then when we move into technical questions I think for me, I actually wrote down a couple of things I used. So when it came to IB technicals, I used the 400 questions guide, which you can just Google and get the free PDF. And then I also used the Wall Street Oasis breaking into finance guide. And again, free online, you can just access it. And my biggest advice would be to stick to nailing the basics and prioritizing the real um, 
beginner information in the technical um in the technicals you should be asked because you can spend a lot of time on the advanced questions but realistically then they won't ask you it in a 20 30 minute interview and if they do it, as long as you have the basics you can at least work towards it with the help of the interviewer um but the biggest thing with technicals is i think not to worry too much if this is where you stumble more because i think a lot of companies are a lot more lenient on this aspect as compared to behavioral or motivational because if you falter on the behavioral or motivational i think that's a lot worse for a company to accept than a technical when you can learn technical but you can't mm. teach behavioral or motivation as, as easily mm. there's actually another part of technical is also commercial so commercial um, awareness questions are, dif are different in the sense you don't need like hardcore technical knowledge skill set but it's actually i think it's way more important to be nailing these to show your interest in the actual industry you'll be joining so for these i use consultancy reports and you can just google m a trends or market trends 2023 search pwc bain any consultancy and they'll write up a summarized document for um the market trends and just use them and to show that you have that knowledge and that you thought about the, that, yeah, that aspect of your career, because it is really important. You, you, you better mention Stephen's uh, Deal Room podcast on a Wednesday, <laughs> otherwise he's going to get upset. <laughs> yeah, no, I did actually use um, Amplify Me a lot for that and their newsletter, to be fair, because it's it's all about finding like a really bite-sized way of taking in mm. information that you can use. Um, a caveat to this was would be, I think, try and find a bit more specific information on a particular division or sector that you're interested in, because then again, you can like display more interest that you've thought about in your interview. Okay, cool. And then going to like the final part, which is say an assessment center, and let's say now the COVID day is touch wood behind us in person, you kind of go to a big premises in Canary Wharf and obviously there's uh, a lot of nerves about but how do you actually deal with that situation I guess dealing with the other people that are with you and kind of I guess um, looking at your competition so to speak and it's kind of like is it collaborative is it competitive like how do you kind of manage that and then any just broad tips um, we don't need to go into all of the activities during an AC but more broadly speaking any kind of quick wins or things that people might have not thought about that you think could be good to know ahead of time yeah for sure so I never had an in-person AC because I was definitely fully oh, co generation yeah. of applicants but I did intern over summer and in Canary where I definitely felt some of the most important things are dressing the part it helps you feel confident but it also plays such an important subliminal role in what your interviewers think of you it's surprising how you know how much emphasis is put into this but especially in investment banking consultancy I think appearance is really highly emphasized so bear that in mind I think that will give a really good first quick win um easy impression if you can dress well question on that then is I think as a guy it's quite easy to dress right in this context because you wear a suit <laughs> wear a white shirt don't have anything too outrageous generally dark shoes you can't really go wrong but as a woman is it is it yeah. more challenging like what sort of heels you wear like color lipstick makeup how much or earrings like I'm asking as a guy I don't I don't know but what is it is it more complex at all for a woman 100 percent. i think um as a as a guy okay not to underplay what a guy would need to wear but it, it is i think it generally is easier and you can reuse outfits maybe easier than a woman can my recommendation would be maybe to wear a tie i think that shows an interview that sh like some people think not to wear a tie but i i know quite a few people who always have said do and they think it, it reflects better but that's just you know personal preference but for a woman I think my biggest advice is to play safe. If you think a shirt is too loud or the neckline is like not, um, uh, you don't feel as comfortable in it, I just would not, I wouldn't risk it. I would just play a really neutral color. The, the best thing is to not draw attention to yourself for your outfit. You should look as good as 
as a part of that company when when you walk through those doors or even if you're interviewing online you shouldn't stand out compared to the employees you should wear something that maybe they would and that means I'd probably say not bright colors no like kind of odd shaped t-shirt or anything just wear as kind of comfortable and simple clothing as you can and play safe in that sense but again no one no one's really worrying too much about what you wear as long as it meets a threshold of you look smart and prepared so yeah it's, it's a good point to know and on the heels part because you did mention that I think that's a concern for a lot of girls um because I I didn't usually wear heels when I worked and I and no one that I really know who was working on the floor wore heels either they're not they're not so much um like cared for in the working environment that I experienced anyway I think in consulting it's different heels are important more important but it's more important to have like comfortable smart shoes and not risk getting blisters the first time you wear the shoes because every single intern that attended training when I joined over summer had blisters and we were all walking really funny so <laughs> I should definitely prioritize the comfort as well and uh, what, what about the um uh, kind of I guess tying interviews because I'm sure in an AC there'll be more interviews um, the actual execution side of that did you ever come across a situation where it was like a, a duo good cop bad cop or there was like a seniority play where it was like the analyst associate but then you step up to the MD and then the differences and how that came across in the interaction yes so from my experience and from what I've um asked of other people too generally the more junior the interviewer you have I feel the more the more grilling you get in terms of your technical ability and your relevant experiences and how you can apply to the role you're applying for because I think they're more interested in what it would be like to have you working under them slash with them whereas when you have a more senior person interviewing you I found there's a lot more emphasis on your personality and your behavioral traits and your motivation for being in that company so that's a, a huge distinction I've found not to say you won't be asked with like vice versa but that's generally the trend I see and you can have interviews with multiple people um, and it's kind of expected that you'll be able to converse with both of them without you know dividing your attention too distinctly between either one I think treat it as much as a conversation as you can and you'll get you'll be answering one question from one person and then the other interviewer will throw a different one at you so just being prepared for you to have multiple conversations or within the same space and or with each other is is something to be ready for and it I think the reason for this is it's preparation for what you'll be doing in the role so during my summer we had to do a case study and part of that the biggest part was the presentation in the final week where we had to present to the entire senior management team for investment banking and this is like a room full of your team see the most senior people in in the investment bank and you have to present your your case study so you'll be asked questions from all over and they won't necessarily be linked so you just have to be ready for the questions to come and be accepting of each one you can't say sorry let me just finish this one or let me just finish on this topic you just have to add, answer the question that you're being asked at that time hmm. and and then how did you find that experience with the other people who are going through the AC with you because not obviously not everyone's going to have success so like how, how was that yeah interaction with the other people as, as in I think as um as insincere as this may sound but I genuinely did live like live by it during summer and during application process is to treat people other applicants not as competition as much as you possibly can because realistically none of this is personal and this is my actually really good advice for how to deal with pressure in general in an AC if you accept that it's not personal and it's not a direct reflection of you as a candidate then I think you'll be able to accept rejection or accept the pressure a lot better than if you put loads of weight on this is me applying for a role and they're rejecting me personally I think that's a really negative way to view it and in the same way when you come into um, an assessment center with multiple other people they're also in the same position as you and the company knows nothing about them or nothing about you except what you're going to present on that day so if you come into it with a competitive mindset 
the company is also monitoring how you behave with other candidates and that's incredibly incredibly important for the type of person that they want to hire who doesn't treat other people um as people to be cautious of but people to work with and i found that in an ac the, the friendliest people or the people who don't um kind of the easiest people to talk to and the ones that don't appear threatened by other candidates are the ones who do the best because they kind of accept there's another 40,000 people applying for this role it doesn't matter me or me or the person sat next to me who's going to get it it all depends on your performance within with the actual interviewer so I think it can add to the pressure when you compare yourself to people but it's not generally the most helpful thing to do yeah no I think that's a good good way to to end the conversation because I think it kind of breaks a lot of um people's misconceptions about how how they think I think you need to behave or how you need to present yourself and how you deal with other people whereas actually just being quite natural and being quite normal is actually the best way to do it (laughs) 100 I think at least at JP Morgan I think your your character is emphasized a lot um how you how you approach people, how you behave with people. And I've met some of the most helpful people um, that I've ever been around during my time there. And even the interns, you know, we're all new. I'm sharing like my notes that I did. Someone else is then gonna share something with me and we all help each other. If someone has like a lot more work to do, I can see how I can help them. And it just creates a really, a really good environment where you can just learn from other people. And I think as a bit of general overall advice, having people with you during the application process is really really helpful Mm -hmm. in terms of um you know asking them how they found their experience at particular company seeing if they can help you and then helping them back um it really helps when if you have an ac with say you have an ac tomorrow with um company x if you can linkedin search or find someone who had the same ac and ask them for help and then you help them back if they need it it's a really really proven way to kind of up your chances of success i think mm. right okay we've covered a lot of the ground um some really good tips some really good uh resources and links actually that you've mentioned so i'll do my best to try and um, bookmark all of these in the kind of episode notes so that people can find them really easily um do you mind if people connect with you on linkedin if they find you yeah 100% 100% that's okay. uh, very welcome okay cool well look all the best with your finals and your return to JP and yeah we'll speak again soon thank you thanks Gory.